Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of the Low Code Cafe, number 81 for February 23rd. Um, we are, uh, we have a great uh, lineup today. A guest presenter, Jerry Maddox, is going to show a solution with Google Maps. We uh, took a look at it yesterday, and I really think this is something you'll be able to uh, use and easily implement into your uh, projects. But um, we'll get into that in just a minute. Um, we'll also be talking about uh, getting ready for our next version 120. Um, so with that, um, let's take a look. Um, this, is, this event is a technical event that we do every Wednesday at uh, 10 a.m. Central Time, and uh, it's just a, a weekly uh, and community webinar. Um, we uh, will solicit some feedback from you, and uh, if, you'll if you'll submit some, I'll promise to put it on a slide here so that uh, we can share it with everyone. Um, all of our past episodes are recorded, so we have 80 hours of very good content that can be used as reference or training. So uh, we encourage you to sign up for our YouTube channel. That's uh, youtube.com slash plant an app and subscribe and, and uh, set for alerts. Uh, our agenda today is, uh, well, this isn't quite accurate. Product roadmap updates, I'm going to cover that today. Bogdan is away on some other business for the morning. Um, and then we'll do an update for, for, uh, from the trenches. I don't believe we'll be hearing from Radu today. And Loco Development is actually our guest presenter, Jerry. So apparently I didn't update the agenda slide. So with that, we'll, uh, we'll take a look at the roadmap updates. Um, I'll, not a lot to announce today, but I do want to call attention to uh, our next status. We are currently in the development cycle. Um, we are looking at a, uh, and, and we'll, we are targeting a beta test start date of March 21st. That's a Monday. And um, our, if, you, if you want to participate in the beta testing, we would uh, appreciate having you do that. It's a, a pretty straightforward process that uh, you can get started if you'll join our, our uh, meetings, our campfire meetings, and I'll say more about that uh, in a minute. But then uh, I believe the target release date is March 28th. Um, what we're gonna see in that is the uh, completion of our efforts to move to Bootstrap 5. Uh, Bogdan will be talking about that more in future episodes, but that's the direction that we're going, and that gives a modern and clean look and feel to the um, to the to our modules and to the way that you develop with them. Um, the it uh, we're also going to be hiding some of our legacy features. We uh, as we as we clean and and uh, remove things that are uh, uh, either no longer uh, widely used. Uh, really no longer necessary. Uh, we, we make them uh, hidden, so uh, we're, we're very sensitive to doing it in such a way that it will not break your applications, but it, it helps uh, stop the use of those things and encourages you to move more towards um, the, the newer replacements. So you'll see that your, your uh, actions and form your, your features will continue to work, but they'll be hidden um, for future use. And then we're continuing with a major spring cleanup, uh, and we'll talk more about that too in a moment. So um, uh, we will call attention to to the feature request section. This is this was developed by our community manager Ben Santiardo, and it ha it has launched several weeks ago. And uh, this Friday in Campfire, we'll be discussing some of the items that have been submitted. Really, it's an opportunity for you to talk about. The, uh, the items that uh, you've posted and why they're important uh, for you and for the product. So um, that'll be a that'll be an interesting conversation, and it will also be an opportunity for you to uh, to uh, throw a question or two at uh, Jerry Maddox uh, at, after today's presentation. Um, let's see. I uh, wanted to. No, I didn't update the headers on this, so uh, please ignore that. But I wanted to point out one of the things that we've decided to do is to, uh, in version 119, we'll be releasing a hotfix. Uh, that is planned, uh, that feature is going to be to be able to do a one-click upgrade of DNN. And uh, this is going to be important because 
um, in our, uh, I'm going to skip past this one for just a second. Um, one, the thing that I want to call attention to in our From the Trenches segment is that uh, we are at version 120. We're moving our DNN minimum to DNN 990. And so if you have um, our current plant and if you're a current plant and app customer and uh, at version 1.19, you're already at, at a spot where this applying this minimum is going to be very straightforward. And so you'll be able to one click uh, upgrade to DNN 990. Of course, we'll all we'll still recommend that you take the appropriate backups and all, but we're making this process as easy as possible. Since we're moving uh, the minimum up to uh, 99, um, it, it, it's going to be required before you can get to version 1.20. So that's for our plant and app clients. For action form and search boost clients, uh, you'll since you don't have without plant and app, there is you won't get this one click upgrade feature. It will be a requir requirement to upgrade uh, before applying the 5.20 uh, version. This we're, we're not classifying this as a breaking change. It's just a minimum requirement. If you tried to install 5.20 and hadn't upgraded, it just wouldn't install. That's part of our installation process, but um, it will uh, it will be then a, a requirement for you to, to upgrade that. Um, and uh, this is this is uh, I think part of our spring cleaning. This this keeping the product healthy by uh, supporting. Um, by moving the support minimum to DNN 9.9, uh, that simplifies the level of support and allows us to go on and do other things. Uh, this won't impact the other DNN Sharp products. If your uh, version 5.19 was the last release um, for um, non-action form, non-search boost products that uh, we previously had in the a DNN community, so uh, this this doesn't apply. With that, we've moved on really quite quickly, and so I'm going to see if Jerry uh, has his uh, microphone and uh, can come on screen and say hello. In a minute, I'm going to flip the screen to you. Good morning, Jerry. How are you, sir? All is good on my end. Can you hear me okay? Absolutely can hear you just great. So I thought I'm going to, uh, to start with, I'm just going to introduce the topic here a little bit. Um, and now I'm, I am actually, uh, give me just a second because I see a question on the, uh, on the chat about reporting bugs that you find in 119. And I'll just say, Jim, the, the, the best thing is uh, if you'll open a ticket on, for example, console.plantandapp.com it provides a nice way for, for all of us to interact with you and support and for us to uh, transfer that information to the development team if they, if they need to get involved. They probably will if it's truly a bug in 119. So thanks for asking that. Okay, so uh, today, Jerry is gonna talk to us about uh, mapping using the Google Map API. And just to kind of set some expectations, we're not gonna touch much on what you need to do to get ready. Uh, this the assumption is that you're going to have a Google API key available to use, uh, but from there, this is going to be a recipe. This is going to be something that if, if you follow these simple steps, and I, I saw it yesterday, it was really quite impressive. You follow these simple steps, you're going to be able to do what Jerry demonstrates today. It is very uh, performance. Uh, it, it's got great performance. It uh, can map a, a, a ton of things and and be then adapted to uh, your particular mapping scenario. And I just think after standing back and look at it, looking at this, this was just a great example of what you can do with low code. We're pulling data in a very efficient way from SQL. We are using the forms module as the way to present the map in, in just a very few number of actions. Um, Jerry has done uh, a, a lot of in, in investment of his time to come up with simplified scripts that uh, can just be adapted very easily. And then, of course, the, the Google Map tool is, uh, is a great tool that, uh, so it's, it's kind of all these shoulders of giants that we're standing on that uh, come together to, you, you would be able to add 
this nice ability to visualize um, your your data in a in a map um, by just you know following these and, and whether it's just a, uh, whether it's a few hours uh, for you to do it or a day, whatever it is, it, it's it's really just a, a, a small investment to get a great benefit. So with that, I'm going to ask Jerry if uh, you would like to share your screen. I will stop sharing here and uh, take us on this journey. There we go. Thank you, Dale. I appreciate that. Um, my uh, my personal headshot video is turned off per you, Dale. So if you would like to have that running, you can, but it's not necessary for this particular uh, okay. demonstration. Um, let's go ahead and get that started. Okay. Thank you for everyone. And I, I hope to be entertaining and uh, informative at the same time during this presentation. Uh, the first thing that in my introduction is what are we doing? Why is this such a big deal? Why is this any different than plotting a pinpoint on a Google map? The difference is, is we're going to plot not one pinpoint, but we're going to plot thousands of pinpoints. And we're not going to plot a pinpoint from a hard-coded address. We're going to dynamically calculate those drop points and display them on the map. Why this was important to me was because uh, over the years, I have been tasked with writing software to where um, it's not uncommon to have our users have a sales force. So with, with our, our database system, if you can imagine, maybe we have sales reps and each sales rep might have two or three customers or two or 3,000 customers or two or 300,000 customers. We don't know. So one of the things that we were asked to do from time to time is, can I plot where my customers are on a map and not be confused with any other customers coming from some other sales rep? So if you could imagine a database system where we had a sales rep, a sales rep table and we had a customer's table and they're related to where the sales rep, uh, the customer knows who which sales rep he belongs to, then it becomes really simple to conceptualize what I'm going to demonstrate for you today. So the first thing that we're going to do is uh, is discuss. There's two points of view. If you own the website or you're the owner of the company, you might want to design a web page where you can select any one of your sales reps and see their customers plotted on a map. If you're the salesperson themselves, you wouldn't be allowed to see all the other people, uh, customers and other, other sales rep, you would only see your own. For today's topic, we're gonna focus on the administration side. We're gonna pretend like we own this company and we have two or three uh, salespeople and we just wanna see what's going on in their world. Um, so the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna be like a, one of those movies that starts out with the first scene is the ending of the movie. And then we're gonna back up and see how we got to the ending of that movie. So uh, if you can see, I'm gonna select a drop down, and I'm going to select this particular salesperson named John Smith. When I click on John Smith, it's going to go drill the data of all of John Smith's customers and plot them on this map. And I want you to notice two things, one, how ridiculous many customers he has and how ridiculously fast PAA was able to put this thing on the screen, go. And there it is. So I'm just gonna let you absorb that for a second. If John Smith has, you know, in this particular case, a couple thousand customers, we dropped a pinpoint on every address out there for him to see his customers. I know that's a ridiculous lot of pinpoints, uh, not too terribly attractive, We'll discuss that as we go on. But here's the cool thing. Now we're gonna select Sam Jones and we're gonna do it again. Clearly a different set of pinpoints. That's the dynamics that we're creating that you would be hard pressed to find a third party module to do this for you. Uh, we had tried and gone through some other thing or, and failed miserably, not suggesting that there's not one but there's not one that works and is nice and is easy really to implement and as clean as what I'm about to show you today. So there, you kind of saw it. 
I have one other salesperson named Dale Warner. Um, quite frankly, he's not quite as hot as the other guys. He's up to one customer now. And, clearly, uh, clearly underperforming. <laughs> but, uh, but as you can see, we see that Dale has, uh, in fact, got one customer. And if I mouse over this pen, we'll see that that particular customer is me. So uh, that that's the sort of the ending of the movie. So let's now talk about how we got there. Okay. And as Dale had alluded to earlier, we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about Google themselves. But for you to implement this, you will need to create a Google account and you'll need to have two particular APIs. One of them is called their JavaScript API for mapping. That's what allows you, us to draw this map. That's what you're seeing is that API being molded and called and illustrated on your screen. The second API that one needs to be able to perform this in your world is their geocoding API. Guys, geocoding is a fancy word that we kind of made up that simply means we have to convert their physical address to a latitude and longitude coordinates for Google to be able to plot this. Google has a service that, and an API that you can pass the address to and you can grab the Latin long from their API and then you can map that back to your particular customer and ultimately display it on the screen. Two quick things I'm gonna talk about that. There, there's been two questions brought up. I'm going to attempt to answer real quick, and then we're going to move on. If we need to pound this into the dirt, we'll do it on Friday during our campfire. One is, is it legal to do what I'm doing? The question has become, can we store latitude and longitude that we acquire from Google into our own database? And uh, the answer is, in all documentation that me and my team have read, yes, it is. If someone can dispute that, please do. I do know that Google has clear written laws about we cannot save the maps, any portion of the maps, anything that is Google property cannot be saved on our server, but a Latin long is not proprietary or owned by Google to my knowledge. So if someone can prove me wrong on that, this is a wonderful, wonderful way to be able to plot your points. The next and I, is, yeah, and, and as as I mentioned to Jerry yesterday, uh, don't we're we're not legal experts, so consult your own attorney. But uh, the, the this is our understanding. And, and yes, and and now the one thing that I can assure you is, it's not completely free. It's not horribly expensive either. But what I have learned in setting this up is, plotting the map, plotting the pinpoints on the map, is free. It's getting the latitude and longitude from their database goes through one of their service APIs and you have to have an account set up with billing and they will bill you that. How much does it cost? The question of the day. Google gave me, when I set up my project, they gave me three or $400 of free money to spend. I have now barked, uh, have latitude and geocoded, I will say, um, thousands, thousands of addresses. And I've not even come close to exceeding that. It's priced at approximately $5 per thousand. Uh, you can read Google documentation on that and it's tiered where if you're doing more, it costs less. So uh, that's all I'm gonna say about that. So it's not completely free. And, uh, but again, if we want to beat that up, I do have more knowledge than I'm letting you have right now on both of these topics, and we can do that in the campfire. So let's move on and keep it fun. Uh, the, the next thing we want to do is I want to sh show you how we actually geocode a customer first. So before we start plotting maps, the first thing that you have to understand is your data, your customer database, or your user's database, you must have a physical address on file. As much of that physical address that you have, the better you're going to geocode. For an example, if you're lackadaisical on your addresses and you don't have all the street addresses for some and some you don't have all the zip codes for other, there's a good chance you're still going to get a latitude and longitude returned to you by Google, but it may not be within uh, 
50 feet, 100 feet. It might be, you know, across town. It might be in a different block. It just depends on how accurate your addresses are. So um, it, that goes without saying, the more specific the address, the further zoom and micro capabilities you will get to, to enjoy this. So uh, that's that. But I, I'm going to show you now, um, check out my notes real quick. The, um, I'm going to show you what my customer entity looks like. So here is a, just a basic screen of what would be about 4,000 fictitious people. Um, just so you know, I robbed this data from one of the public domain databases. I changed the last names to Smith and Jones. I've done everything I can to protect the identity of these people, but uh, it's, it's just garbage data. The Go to the entity, and I'm just going to rapidly show you. And this particular entity, sorry, I got. I'm going to show you that I have over and above first name, last name, address, city, region, postal code, and country. That's my primary entity. Then I have latitude. I have a column for longitude. I have a column for something called place ID. I have a column for something called formatted address. And then sales rep is a column that points back to the entity sales rep. That's how I'm tying my customers back to my sales rep. All of this is stock PAA. There is no fancy programming going on here at all. But I had to add latitude and longitude for obvious reasons. And that's the minimum that I had to add. But I went ahead and added place ID and formatted address because that is something that the Google API will return to you that if you're using advanced features of Google, having those tucked away in your database can become very beneficial uh, later in life. But again, all I really had to do was, was have a place to stick my latitude and longitude and that was it. So that's what my customer entity looks like. Incredibly simple. Uh, again, no magic here, but let me then show you what happens. Sorry, guys, get back on my customer database. We are going to um, add a new customer for Dale. He, he needs the help. So when I add a new customer, this particular customer is a Pizza Hut in Texas. And their address is 6409 Hillcrest Avenue, Dallas. Get Texas going. Their zip code or postal code is 75205. I don't think I'm going to go now. Okay. And we're going to attach it not to John, not to Sam, but to Dale. And we're going to add. When we add, Pizza Hut is now in our database. But if you will look along our grid, you will see my latitude and longitude columns are already populated. That's because during the ad process or the edit process, I called a workflow. And I just simply added the workflow. Again, stock PAA, Dale, no, no fancy programming. I just went into the standard code. And on the add actions, when we hit the add button, this guy right here, execute geocode customer. All I did was simply create a workflow and then create an action that calls that workflow. And I'm passing in the new customer ID. That's the ID of the customer that just got inserted. I'm going to call that. I'm going to go to the workflow. I'm going to grab that Latin long, and then I'm going to update the customer's database. So I'm going to show you that workflow now. And that's exactly the way that, um, you know, we would recommend that, that uh, you would use this kind of form, right? That um, 
Sure, and, and it was just so for simple. that kind of customization. Maybe. Yeah, again, it was so simple because you know, as you know, guys, I didn't have to write all these screens that you're seeing. But most of these screens were just created by the entity itself, and I just jumped in and made just a few little simple changes that made sense for this particular thing. And I'll go to workflows. I will select edit workflow. And lo and behold, look what we have. Read customer. I cannot tell you how simple this is. This is an action that reads the customer. So first, on my input of my workflow, I'm passing in the ID of the customer that I want to geocode. So mm -hmm. I grab that record. And uh, this simple action brings in your customer and stores it into a token called customer. No longer do I have to write SQL queries to do this deal. It's just a straight up action that brought my customer in. Now that I have my customer, here's where some magic happens, guys. Let me show you this. This is the server request to where we're going to call Google. And we're gonna call their, this particular API and look what we're gonna pass in. In the uh, question mark address, query string parameter, we're gonna pass in customer colon address. That's the address for the customer that I just read in with that first action. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna pass in the city. I'm gonna pass in the state. I'm gonna pass in the customer postal code. And I'm gonna pass in the customer country. I'm sorry, accidentally scrolled out. And last but not least, I'm passing in my API key. My API key is stored in my tokens. So anytime I need to call one of these server requests, I just call, I just use the tokens. I don't have to type in that big old long ugly string of characters that represents what my token is. So that server action is then going to return into a column or a token that I call geocode JSON. That JSON string is going to come back and it's it's a pretty nice JSON string. For those of you that are JSON programmers, it's not too terribly ugly, but it does have a nested array inside. <clears throat> so I have to par parse it twice. I parse it the first time to get to the element that has the array in it, and then I parse it the second time. That's what these two actions are doing. And at the end of the day, when I have it parsed, I simply do a partial update on the customer. For those of you that don't already know, partial update is an action that just lets you select some of the columns in the customer record that you want to update. I'm going to update the latitude and the longitude, place ID and the formatted address. The property values that you're seeing, even though they look a little ugly and might seem technical some, that is nothing more than the token that was parsed out of the return JSON from Google. Super simple stuff. And uh, as you can see on this particular one, results, element zero, it's in a element called uh, geometry.location.lat. That is Google that's dictating those names that gives you that. And once you open the JSON string and you look at that and you go, okay, no worries. But PAA made this super easy. Again, no, no fancy programming. I just used the parse JSON to get this into some tokens. It made sense. And now that I have these tokens, I can then update these into my data table, the latitude, longitude, place ID, and the formatted address. It, it's that simple. So Perfect. for fun, I created these out, I created output. Um, I created the output just so I could see it, I'm not passing the output to any other actions right now. In this particular workflow, I'm, I've elected to go ahead and do the service request and geocode the customer and update the customer in this one workflow. Had I wanted to just create a workflow that did geocoding and just return the geocoding and then maybe do my update and a different action and a different action stack, uh, no problem, could have done that. But for this example, again, I wanted this to be as short, sweet code as possible. But guys, but it, that's it certainly all does, it takes. Certainly does help like with debugging. When you're, when you're working on something like that, you, uh, you can save and test and type in your customer number and it's, you'll, you can see all the results coming back real easy. So you know you've Absolutely. got it. 
absolutely. And, uh, you know, so, so all of that workflow does is jump out to Google and return me a Latin long, um, in simple words, I chunk it into my, uh, customer entity and now it's there and ready to be plotted. So with, with that said, um, We're ready let's, to go have some, let's go have some fun with the map. Now, now we've got the kind of got the grunt work done. Uh, let's go back and take a look at, uh, what the map might look like. And, um, so I'm going to come back to the map customers. And if you remember this screen, now we have this. So what, what makes this tick? How, how difficult is this to do? So let me tell you what you're looking at. You're looking at a good old fashioned action form setting on this page. And this action form has just a couple of cop fields in it. There's just not a whole lot going on, guys. Um, the show map data column is for me for debugging. It is remarked out. Uh, it, the show parameter is set to false, so it does not show. But if I turn it on, it actually shows me the data coming in. Again, it's a debugging tool. But I have a simple dropdown that I select my... Uh, um, sales reps from. And I'm using a SQL query, but I imagine I probably could have used a PAA action to load that drop down just as simple. Then I have a static text box that is uh, where all the fun really happens. And in this static text box, we have some code. Now, before we start really delving into this code, I'm going to break it down for you piece by piece, and I'm going to tell you that I have oversimplified some of Google's work, some of their JavaScripts. I have gone through and found the best of their best and carved them down to where they are just so easy to deal with to, to build this. So if you go to Google and you're looking at their documentation, you will probably find some things that are very similar here, but you'll also find things that are incredibly different and more complicated and confusing and and just completely destructive to your confidence in trying to make this happen. If you copy and paste my code, which you will have the ability to do, just very minimal modification, you'll have this baby running on your own systems. So on this piece, of, this first piece of code, the first thing that we have to do, and this is Google doing this to us, not me, we have to create a div tag and we have to give that div tag an ID and we need to give it just enough height and width style. That div tag, the first thing that you're seeing at the top of this code is where Google expects your map to live. And the Google JavaScript is gonna to talk to this div tag based on the idea of the div tag. I named it customer map. You can name it anything you want. The next little bit of code that's in here is the actual JavaScript that's going to call the Google API and draw the map on the screen. Now, again, if you will analyze the SRC and this, you will see where I'm passing the my Google API key. That's again is stored in a token. You will have your own, you can name your token anything you want, but the exact code does its thing. But before any of this happens, we have to build the map. We have to actually construct the map. And again, this is all based on the JavaScript that was provided and or developed by the Google engineers. So before I freak you out, I'm going to try and give you some great comfort. From this point down, from this script tag down, is only this big. And I have it spaced out with remarks, guys. It's that. There you go. There's your code. Beginning, middle, end. That's all it takes to start this project. And uh, so when uh, uh, <laughs> it, once I got it carved down to just this, it made it so easy to conceptualize. Now, we're going to focus on the... The first step is we have to initialize the map. 
Again, this is not really intended to be a computer programming lesson as much as for those of you that know a little bit about Java, seen a little bit of this before, you'll, you'll see real quickly what we're doing. We're, we have to initialize a map. And I create a variable called customer map. And I'm doing, I'm making an object out of that by calling the Google Maps dot map document, get element ID, blah, 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 based on the name of that div ID. That customer map out in the middle, that get element ID, that's going out and attaching this map that we're going to create to that div tag. And now that that's done, we have now created a map object that we can describe. The next parameter is the zoom. That's just how deep the zoom is. That's all it is. It's like when you're pressing positive or negative buttons on the map to zoom in and out, I'm defaulting to four, which by the way, just happens to be an, a wide enough viewpoint that you can see the entire United States. Center, that's the Latin long for I want the center of this particular map to be. That Latin long coordinates that you're seeing is somewhere in Kansas and it makes the map center up onto the screen for the United States nicely. But one could program that center parameter and have it centered in Europe, have it centered in Hawaii, or even better, how about this? Have it centered based on the sales rep that you selected. So if you're a sales rep in Dallas, maybe you center the map on Dallas, Texas, and you kind of expect the customers to be somewhere in and around the Dallas Fort Worth area. Maybe not. That's completely programmable by us. And if we Dale, if we choose, if we find enough interest and we do another week of this, I will be more than glad to take this thing next level and show you how that works. But it's really cool. So we're going to move on to this guy right here. This guy begins right here. And for those of you that know JavaScript, we'll jump right in it and know what I'm doing. But this guy is like a good old fashioned for next loop or a do while loop. This is a looping construct that is reading an array of data that we built to pass to the map. And so inside this looping construct, we are creating the markers. Guys, a marker is that red pen mark that you saw on the map. When you, to create the marker, if you happen to have a thousand customers, we have to create a thousand markers. So this looping construct is gonna loop through this array that we will discuss momentarily and extract the data from the array, create a marker at that particular person's Latin long, store a couple of things away. And as it spins through that, it, I guess JavaScript and Google are building whatever they need to display the map. And so now you're seeing the whole thing on the screen. Uh, we return the marker. This is the closing. Uh, French bracket in parentheses for this entire loop. So there, I'll leave that on the screen for a second for you to kind of just absorb that. That loop is looping through Dale's couple of customers or John Smith's thousands of customers and building those markers. And that's all there is to it. That's it. So when you run it, let's take a moment and go revisit that. And we run John Smith, who has a lot, and I click submit. It initialized the map that we created an array or a string of data that we're going to talk about next. And then, lo and behold, it plotted it on the map. That many things. And because okay, we, haven't, we haven't seen my two customers yet, so I really. Okay, so let's that. do. Let's do. Let's go to Dale and let's see. And if all things went well, here is the Pizza Hut in Dallas. Now, uh, with that said, you know, one might want to know, okay, great, you plotted pens on a map, whoopee, but how did you get the data from the entity to the map? That's the real trick, and, and one of the things, so I'm going to go to a page. Guys, this is not, this page that you're looking at is just an HTML module with notes to us to read. That's all this is. There's no code happening here. There's no PAA, but I want you to look at this. That red ink at the top of that page is a string of data. Now I know some of you are looking at that going, that's JSON. 
No, it is not. Boy, it sure looks like it, doesn't it? But it is not JSON data. It is just a, an array that JavaScript and Google like. You can build this array out as far as you want or as minimum as you want. So there are three particular records in this string. Let's focus only on the top one, and then this will all start to make sense to you. If we built a string that looked exactly like this, we would plot that to the map in a token that I called map data. And when, I, when we built the array, we have a heading called lat, a heading called long, a heading called name, and another one called address. The lat and long is the only thing required to plot a pinpoint on a map. But what good does it do any of us if we plot the lat and long for a thousand pins and we don't know which who each pin belongs to? So I created a name element in this array and I created an address element in this array. And then I created an array, not for one person, but for many people. So I'm going to very- I think you're gonna be surprised uh, when they see it about how easy it was for you to create this array. Well, and that's what we're gonna talk about. And again, guys, I'm a SQL guy. I'm in it really deep. I use SQL for this. I am suspicious. I probably could have used load entities and spin through entities and done this same thing. You could have done this possibly in a razor script. You probably could write your own C sharp and do this. But here is the goal. The mm -hmm. goal is this. You must spin through all of your customers and build a string, not a JSON object, a string that is formatted like what you see on my screen. And if you want to add other things to that array inside those French brackets, you can. For our example, I only put four things in, lat, long, name, and address. And that That'll become abundantly clear as we jump into this. So for those of you that haven't already looked at my SQL query, if you will look under the select statement, I'm just concatenating the string and I'm building it right there. So I'm doing a select from my customer table. The only reason why I had to join the sales rep table is so I could isolate the customers to a particular sales rep, that's it. So I'm spinning through these records and I'm concatenating, building this mega long string. My, you know, could be thousands of characters, but it's, it's just a string. For those of you that are not as familiar, but want to be with SQL, one might ask, how do you spin through SQL serve through a table and just keep gluing something onto the end of itself to where at the end of the day, you just return this massively long string with all those records in it. Go study the four XML path commands of SQL Server, and you will learn real quickly. And if you don't want to study it, copy my, my code, because that's all you have to do, and you will get a string come back out. So real quickly in the SQL, I declared a variable called var car max called map data. I do this SQL command, and at the bottom, I end up selecting my map data into a token when this uh, event ends. And that's it. That's all one has to do. So let's get off of this page. Let's go look at that really fast. So I'm going to go back to my map customers, and I'm going to edit my customer. All right, guys, as you could just possibly, some of you are way ahead of me and already figured this out. This all happens on the pre-init. And on the pre-init, guess what? You're going to see that exact code that I just showed you on the page. Sorry about my scrolling, Dale. I have to move your picture around and my picture around to get to my windows and my scroll bars. Okay, so here we go. The exact query that I just showed you runs. It is bound to the sales rep ID by the query string that we're passing in. That's how it knows which sales rep to 
identify. And when it's finally finished, it will dump out the data as a string in a token called map data. And if map data is empty, as in when we load the form, there's no harm. It, the map will still load, it just won't have any points on. Dale, we're gonna go turn on this guy real quick so we can show them the data mm -hmm. as we bring it in. And uh, we're gonna try our best not to freak everybody out and we're gonna select you because if I select those other guys, that string of data is gonna be really gross to look at. Okay, there you go. I'm gonna let you study that just for a second. So the SQL that SQL command, that's right, Dale, it generated that string. And some of you hardcore guys, I'm going to show you something that it, it annoyed me to death, but man, oh man, it was sweet that, that JavaScript and or Google just allowed it to happen. The, we have two elements in this string, two, two arrays in the string, how you're going to look at it. And notice that trailing comma on the end. Most of the time, you would not want a trailing comma on the end. Mm -hmm. If you're passing in parameters, comma delimited parameters, you tend not to have a comma setting out there on the end. In the Google API, where we're spinning through the markers to build the markers, somebody over at Google got real nice and said, it's okay. You okay. can just build a string, comma delimited string of this data and we'll take it even if you leave that trailing comma on. Normally, I would have stripped that off, but I left that on for a reason because I wanted you to know it's okay. It's just one of those things in life they, they gave us a break on. So now that we have seen that, let's run back into the code. Yeah, and revisit. Yeah, well, yeah, we'll revisit one last time. Yeah, we'll turn this back off. Um, for those of you that are curious, had I left this turned on and ran it for John Smith, you would have had about three foot of scrolling of just what mm -hmm. that string would have looked like. It's pretty gross. And um, so we come back into this guy right here. And so, so basically, this is what happens. That little bit of code initialized the map. This little bit of code spun through that. Where your map data goes. Right there is my map data token. It got generated and the rest is history. So let me read my notes real quick and uh, done all that. We're good on this. I, I, th I think you covered it well. This is a nice I, recipe. What, <clears throat> what else can you do? Okay. So like any good movie in this particular movie, I showed you the ending first. And then I come back and showed you how we got to that ending. But I have two very important alternate endings, Dale. One of them, and uh, again, a picture's worth a thousand words. Let's go run the map again. Dale and others, if I mouse over this pen, I can see my name. And I can see the Pizza Hut. That's just the first and last name column. You remember in that array that I loaded, I had an element called name. Mm -hmm. And I put it into that array and I read it. And that's what I'm doing. The pen itself in Google Maps can be so much smarter than that. They have, uh, they being Google in their code, has something called listeners. A listener is nothing more than a little tiny snippet of JavaScript that says, I'm listening to each pinpoint. What would you like to do? Would you like to click this pinpoint and execute some actions? Would you like to mouse over this pinpoint and execute some actions? They have these little listeners that do that. They also have an object that they call an info window, an information window. So when you mouse over this pen, the stock or standard, what we'll call information window is Pizza Hut right now, or my name, if we mouse over this one. But if we wanted to design something much more robust than that, this is the code for it. Now guys, this code is exactly what we just went over. 
no changes, just a couple of add-ons. So I'm going to add on this little guy right here, which creates an info, an, an info window object that just creates the object. It's currently empty. Then remember my spinner, my four next loop, if you will, guys, right here. And we built the markers right here. Now we have a couple of listeners. I chose to use mouse over and mouse out. I had to create two listeners. That means when I move the mouse over a pinpoint, something's going to happen. When I move the mouse out of the pinpoint, something else is going to happen. So when I move the mouse over, I am going to call the window object, the info window object, and set the content to something called customer info. Well, guys, here's what customer info is. I just created a variable called customer info, and what did I do? I took the customer.name and the customer.address. I built some HTML bold tags and a BR tag in there to make it look nice. So when I execute this, this is what you can expect to see. I mouse over. I'm going to see the customer name, and I'm going to see their full address. And when I mouse out, it's going to go away. So how do we make that work? It's this simple. I'm going to grab every bit of this code. And again, that's exactly the same code as before. I'm going to go to back to maps. I'm going to edit the map. And I realized I could have done this glamorous and had you three different pages set up for all that. But I wanted you to see the actual programming trip that, that I had to take to make this happen and how simple it is for you. Now that I do that, I'm going to post this code, which again is the identical code that was already there with just a couple of add-ons, very small add-ons. I'm going to go back to Dale. This time, when I mouse over the Pizza Hut, I get something that's a little bit more glamorous. So. If I mouse over me, I get that. Now, why is that cool? Why is this important to you? This is why. Because you have no limits to what you can do with this box. You can burn in HTML to your imaginary, can't stand it. You can burn in data from your PAA entities. All you have to do is get it in that stream that I talked about. If you bring that it in, be, that could you be now images. have that. That could be actionable, click a link to do something. You know, I've not tested everything in its fullest degree, but I, from what I'm seeing, there are little or no limits to what I can do with this box. And so let's go get crazy and take us into the... Wait, wait. You didn't actually hide. You didn't make that false yet on your debugger. So let's flip and uh, your map. Oh, you're right. I didn't. Look at yeah, that. I don't think you saved. So Yeah. Thank, thank you for pointing that out, Dale. Uh, We'll go hide that just so we don't uh, force them to wait for me to scroll down. I'll just chunk a zero in there. Zero or false would make that go away. I'm still a binary guy, you can tell. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> so okay, so we come back, things look nice. Okay, let's go make this map really stupid. Oh my gosh, how in the world, Dale, will it ever know all of those? addresses and names and listeners. This is why, because as I span through that four next loop, so to speak, I created a listener for mouse in or mouse over and mouse out. And I created a marker for every single thing that was in that array. So when I mouse over this guy, there it is. I go down in here into the crowd. Mm -hmm. and I'm lost. And of you course, we, you haven't done it, but this is zoomable. You can click plus and oh, absolutely. Match absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and, and we'll say that. So in our last five minutes, I'm going to give you the last alternate ending. What do you do when you're not plotting Dale's Salesforce every day, but you're plotting John Smith's Salesforce every day? And it's just overwhelming. Well, with a little additional code to this code, we can create something that Google calls marker clusters. And to do that, it, there's a little bit extra install work, some things you need to put on your server, a JavaScript file and a couple of images that give you full access to this. Again, if this is something that 
really interest you on campfire and other possible future things, I will break that down for you and show you how I've made that super simple for you as well. But in the meantime, I'm going to show you again, and I promise to be done almost inside of our time limit. <laughs> this is the same code that we just talked about, but now we're going to enter this guy. Marker cluster JS file. This is a pointer to that JS file that I said you would have to load on your server. And that comes from Google, right? That comes from Google. Yes, we can obtain right. that from Google. Everything else is identical until the very end where I do this guy. This guy, sorry, there you go. After I have spanned through all of the markers creating them, this little guy creates an object called market cluster, marker cluster with all those markers. And there's a path in there that's pointing to a set of images that you will see shortly. So basically, Dale, I added two very minor lines of code mm -hmm. to the existing code I just showed you. I'm going to copy and paste this code. We're going to demonstrate it. All right, team. Remember John Smith? Now John Smith's organization has been reduced into markers, marker clusters. Everywhere you see that, I call it a nuclear looking symbol, but whatever you want to call that symbol, uh, with a number in the side of it, that tells you how many pens or how many markers are inside that cluster of markers. So if I'm, and if I have an exposed pen point, such as this guy way up here in Minnesota, um, it's ready to be moused over. This guy's ready to be moused over. This guy. But if I mouse over one of these others, I'm going to go up into the Seattle region just because I haven't been up there in a while. And I'm going to click on that. And it's going to zoom down to Seattle. I'm going to mouse over this guy. Here's this person. There's so it was still eight, three. and now we got three, four, and one. So eight. Yeah. Yep. So we have three markers inside this cluster. So we can zoom in tighter, and now we're seeing all four, the one that was already exposed, and these guys. And you can zoom in to your heart's content, and you can zoom back out. And as you zoom in and out, that little bit of code is auto doing those clusters for you. I wish I could brag about that, guys. That's Java, that's uh, Google doing that for us. And if I just keep pulling back and pulling back and pulling back and pulling back, you ultimately see we have 2,505 people that we just plotted on this map, but and we can now manage them somewhat easier. Well, a good bit easier than before. I'm going to click Sam, and we'll go to Sam, and we will see his market clusters are a good bit simpler, clearly different. We're going to go to Dale, and I don't suspect it's going to cluster at all because me and that Pizza Hut are so far apart that they didn't mm -hmm. cluster. Mm -hmm. But I bet if we were to zoom back, Dale, at some point, there you go. There it is. <laughs> so, and uh, so there, there's that. And uh, so that concludes my demonstration. Uh, you, you've seen exactly how that works, what, you know, what can come from it. Uh, again, it'll be up to you guys in the uh, chats, the requests, the whatever, to let Dale know if you would like to see this go to a next level because there are other things that we can do that are really exciting. Uh, and I will be available on Campfire on this Friday for more extensive questions. But uh, I, I'm going to stay with you, Dale. I'm going to stop now. I know we're right at the midnight time or at the midnight hour of our time slot, but I am here. If you want to go through some questions, I'll be glad to. Perfect. I am. Uh, so I've grabbed the screen share back and I'm uh, just going to say, you know, run through that. I think. The, that was a great demonstration. You took us there right on time. And, you know, I can't emphasize enough. This is, there's a, there's a nice recipe there. Jerry has been gracious enough to share those file, those uh, scripts that you were looking at with us. And so we'll make sure those are available as a link either to this <laughs> recording or on our campfire website. And I do encourage you to continue the discussion with us on campfire 
uh, on Friday, uh, 10 Central. And uh, I see we're getting a little bit of applause from the uh, on the chat. So uh, thank you much. And um, just hope that this uh, is something that that you can add value to uh, to your websites. Very good. That's it for uh, Low Code Cafe for this Wednesday. We will see you again next week.